Hey everyone, it's been over two minutes. I haven't been raped yet. But I was subjected to Windows 8. And I must say that Microsoft owes us an explanation. Now apologize! What, uh, me to you? Apologize. All right, all right, I apologize. You're really sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I apologize unreservedly. Stop playing. Break free from your chains. To break free from your cage. What we don't want to do is go back to a traditionalist world. Hi, I'm Diana Davison. You might have noticed that I just finished saying, as I do in the intro for many of my videos, that we don't want to go back to a traditionalist world. I've been asked many times to explain this, and I've actually spent some time because it's a complicated subject in a way. It shouldn't be, but it is. So I've been trying to figure out how to best explain it. In my last video, I was talking about um, the problem behind feminism that a, a lot of people in the uh, men's rights community and in the MGTOW, men going their own way community, have um, blamed feminism for society's problems right now, which is mostly social justice problems. And feminists are uh, very dominant voices in the cultural and social changes that we see taking place, which are to a large extent uh, making men um, criminals by birth. So um, uh, there's been a lot of angst towards feminism specifically as the cause of all ills. My last video I was talking about an article from a website called Spiked Online and they identified, I think correctly, that it's postmodernism on which feminism is riding the wave of postmodernism and I'll link to that below. Um, there's another article from Spiked that I want to talk about today which helps me to explain why we don't want to go back to traditionalism. Now, I think it's pretty obvious if you follow comment sections in my videos and in many other men's rights videos, mostly MGTOW actually, that um, there's a large portion of men in the men's rights community who are traditionalists, who really want to go back to a world where, you know, men are the, wear the pants in the household and women fulfill their traditional roles and men, you know, and the reason that they're attracted to this is because people are attracted to uh, a social structure in which they understand the roles clearly. They can perform their roles, they are comfortable with those roles, they know what's expected of them, and it makes life easy, right? So that's the attraction to um, the traditional lifestyle. And it's uh, generally a conservative point of view and hence why traditionalists are often called tradcons, traditional conservatives. So I want to talk about what I'm espousing and the reason why I like the MGTOW community and support the MGTOW community, which a lot of people are really suspicious of. So hopefully this will, you know, deal with a bunch of stuff all with one stone. All right, so let's start out talking about traditional gender roles and what is MGTOW. Now, no one person can answer what is MGTOW because there's a bunch, a bunch of different reasons why men find themselves in the MGTOW community and in the men's rights community in general. MGTOW more specific. The MGTOW community is shrugging off social expectations and there's a lot of discussion in the community about what men are expected to do in terms of um, protect and provide for women. and. That is the core of the expectations on men in general in society. And uh, be you uh, politically on the left or politically on the right, the majority of people expect men to rescue women in distress, to, um, to have children with women and to become a provider and to dedicate their lives to being a so-called good man. And the MGTOW community has said, you know, I'm not really keen on you telling me what it is I'm supposed to spend my life, you know, devoted to, what I'm supposed to use my resources to attain, and you telling me what happiness is. And so they're basically, they're walking away from social expectation, and as a result, and in combination, walking away from the expected gender role. Now, it gets really interesting because feminism actually rejects gender roles as well and social justice warriors who go, you know, many steps beyond feminism, um, reject the concept of gender completely. So when you start talking about, you know, gender roles, then 
um, quite often if you say that you reject them, you will get called a feminist. And I think there is a problem with words and concepts being linked to ideologies that is getting in the way of reasonable discussion. And words are important. Um, that's why feminist and social justice warriors target words for elimination from the English dictionary so often. They try to ban words from being said and so on because words are tools to communication. And in the article I want to discuss, there's a couple of words that, that I can foresee will present a problem in communicating these ideas. So uh, the words that need to be dealt with in this article, liberalism. Now, Spiked Online is devoted mainly to freedom of speech and to the rights of an individual. And this is termed liberalism. In Canada, where I'm from, there is a political party called the Liberal Party. So this causes some confusion for Canadians in my audience. When, the, when liberalism comes up, they're not talking about the Liberal Party. Um, liberal is also a derogatory term. It's like, oh, you know, liberal ideas, right? And they, it's conflated with being leftist. And the way Spiked uses this term is not a um, leftist idea. It's not a communist idea. They're talking about liberalism in terms of the um, liberty of humans, their rights in a state of um, negative rights. Negative rights and positive rights, as they use these, is also kind of confusing in a way because if you think negative rights you're thinking it's bad because it's negative. Negative rights means that the state, if one exists, um, exists to um, the rules in place, the laws that are there, are to prevent the state from interfering with your liberty. They are to prevent the state from arbitrarily arresting you and they're to make sure that you have the right of free speech, the state can't silence you. Those are called negative rights because they prevent the state from doing something. Positive rights are where the state is put in charge of interfering and um, and assisting in society. You know, left you know leftist sort of ideology considers the interference of the state to be a useful thing, something that will help the um, underprivileged attain equality. And so the state must interfere because they believe people are bad, and the state must become like a nanny. They must become like a babysitter or a parent to the individuals within the society. Negative rights are, I guess you would say, more right wing, but it doesn't have to be left and right. What you're talking about is individuals. And that is what I would call myself, an individualist. And this article on Spiked, and I'm going to get to that next, is talking about what individualism is and what the attack upon individualism is. So. A little bit from the article now that I've kind of set up the problem with the words involved. And this conservative representation of individualism as a narrow-minded egotistical outlook that selfishly ignores the needs of others in society continues to predominate. The Oxford English Dictionary, for example, describes individualism as the habit of being independent and self-reliant, behavior characterized by the pursuit of one's goals without reference to others. In case the reader missed the implicit moral judgment here, the OED adds that individualism comes sometimes with negative connotations of self-centeredness or antisocial behavior. Now I read that part first because I want to state one of the reasons that I'm against socialism. Socialism legislates compassion and then they tell you that you need them because the result of legislating compassion is that you end up with people in society who don't take care of each other because they gave it the office, they paid their taxes, and they have been basically stolen from, and they feel depleted, so they don't feel they have anything to give. You can't look at society in our current societies and then judge whether or not people are um, compassionate towards each other, whether they work well together, even in an individualist state, when you're judging them under a system that's already taken away their resources. So. One of the things in the left versus right debate, uh, it actually whittles down to whether or not you believe people are innately good or innately evil. And of course, there are many shades of gray that you can end up uh, finding yourself believing in between those two things. But the socialist system believes people are mostly evil and that unless you force them to be compassionate, 
they will basically stomp on each other's heads to get to the top. And a free market society, um, a minimal government, government um, concept, believes that people are good and that if you leave them unto themselves, they will be civil to each other and they are perfectly capable of managing their own affairs. In her new book, Individualism in the United States, Stephanie Walls explores how the meaning of individualism has evolved and changed since the late 18th century. One of the merits of Walls' book is the recognition that the meaning of political concepts is subject to historical variation. Some of the core terms used in the political vocabulary of the 21st century, liberal, conservative, Marxist, Democrat, have meanings that are surprisingly different to those they had in the past. In her account of the changing meaning of individualism in American political thought, Walls draws a distinction between what she characterizes as political individualism, economic individualism, and social individualism. She praises the virtues of the political individualism prevalent during and immediately after the American Revolution. She is clearly critical of the ascendancy of economic individualism in the mid-19th century, and she blames the hegemonic influence of social individualism for the ills that affect, afflict contemporary America. She concludes that social individualism comprises the stability of American society, and this has an adverse effect on democracy. All right, so the article from Spiked Online is talking about a book written by this author, Stephanie Walls, and that little section that I read is to basically get people aware that when they talk about politics and ideologies and stuff, that the meanings of these words do change, and the result is um, confusion and uh, increasing difficulty in explaining what it is you're trying to promote. So if you say liberal, you trigger ideas in your audience, and then they don't actually understand what you're talking about anymore. If you say individualism, that that can trigger other preconceived ideas about what it is you're talking about, and communication um, is getting increasingly difficult. It's always really annoyed me, actually, how a word has an original meaning, and then if it gets misused in you know popular consumption and in, in um, you know general dialogue, it gets misused often enough. A new meaning gets added to the dictionary as to what this word actually means, and it gets very difficult to communicate. I, I care a lot about communication, having a good vocabulary you know, that's that's a great thing and it's useful, but the vocabulary at your disposal is only useful in terms of how well you can communicate with it to the average person. And um, especially in politics, I see all these terms and phrases and concepts being thrown around and um, the meanings are sometimes almost reverse of what the original meaning was intended to represent. Time and again, Walls criticizes negative liberty on the grounds that it represents the rejection of community and social solidarity. She identifies the strength of society with an interventionist state that protects the individual. Yet history shows that community and social solidarity emerged through the shared experience of individuals collaborating with one another, and often in opposition to the state. Indeed, it can be argued that state intervention in everyday life corrodes community life no less, and arguably even more, than market forces. In many societies, people who come to rely on the state depend far less on each other and on their community. When what matters is access to the state, then many citizens can become distracted and stop cooperating and working with fellow members of their community. Right, so this idea that um, good living, that solidarity among people has to be instilled upon people, that they aren't compassionate, that they won't work together, that connects to my rejection of traditionalism. Uh, traditionalism and the state of marriage between men and women or, you know, people and their partners, whichever gender that happens to be, the idea that they can't be moral, they can't commit to each other, and they will be chaotic and destructive unless we enforce a structure upon it. Um, it works against the idea of liberty, and I think it actually works against the natural inclinations of people to work together. Um, I have observed that people can be in a really great relationship, and the moment they enter into marriage 
everything changes. You've got the ball and chain effect where you're now trapped with this person and the enforcement of a bond between people in any form will actually corrupt the natural bonds that can take place. That voluntary relationships and, um, and exercising compassion in a way that is your choice and not your duty, your public duty uh, or your social duty will actually have better results than any of these institutions that people foist upon the public under the impression that people are innately evil in some way. The main virtue of negative liberty is that it encourages citizens to exercise freedom for themselves. The experience of fighting to gain freedom and of making decisions about the future animates people's active sides. Living freedom and having to live with the consequences of choices are essential for overcoming the mood of passivity that afflicts public life today. And there we go, consequences. One of the biggest criticisms in the men's rights community, and especially in MGTOW, is um, the result of women living in a world in which they don't face consequences. Uh, they're deemed to be helpless and blown by the wind from one circumstance to another, and living in a patriarchal, oppressive world that prevents them from making the choices to which they would otherwise be held accountable. Participating in society, uh, becoming an adult, means having the ability, the freedom to define yourself, to make choices, to learn from your choices, to um, define your own sense of morality, and to suffer the consequences for poor choices. And yet, we have a nanny state that assumes that we're incapable of these things, that all of our affairs must be micromanaged, and the result is that it saps the life out of people. The reader is told that on the societal level, modern individualism's emphasis on autonomy and alienation creates or exacerbates issues of insecurity, distrust. What's fascinating about this polemic against autonomy is that it expresses sentiments that are widely shared across the political divide. Walls is therefore tilting at windmills Individual autonomy simply is not culturally valued today. In America, even traditional conservative and leftist social justice activists are at one in their denunciation of autonomy. The conservative legal scholar Mary Ann Glendon writes that by exalting autonomy to the degree we do, we systematically slight the very young, the severely ill, or disabled. Likewise, anti-liberal social justice campaigners also claim that the concept of autonomy is an insult to the underprivileged who lack the means to exercise choice. All right, so obviously I recommend reading that article and it is a difficult one to get through because the terminology is so convoluted. It's come to mean so many different things to so many different people, but it's written by Frank Furetti, who I really admire, and it's on Spiked Online, another a site which I really admire as well. They're doing some great work for individual freedoms, freedom of speech, and uh, liberty for people based on Magna Carta rights. So check that out. And uh, But I want to finish up, I guess, by just tying it back to why do we not want to go back to traditionalism and why I support MGTOW. I, I, hopefully that's been clear. The MGTOW community encourages autonomy, it encourages you from stepping out to other people dictating your morality and your life choices. And it trusts people to do not just what's best for them, but in the MGTOW community, you see a lot of bonding going on. You see a lot of compassion. Anyone who follows the MGTOW community, and uh, you know, I'm going to link to Spetsnaz below and Barbarossa, because I got to say, Barbarossa is one of the leaders of the MGTOW community. When you listen to him on his Google Hangouts and on his um, podcasts, he's got people who are new voices in the community. And instead of using his opportunity on those shows to promote himself, he actually tries to not talk that much. He tries to draw people out of their shell and get them communicating their ideas. He is actually promoting an incredible sense of community within MGTOW that um, I have to applaud. I think that it's not just great what he's doing, but it tells you a lot about him as a person and about people in, in terms of their ability to handle power um, when they're wise and when they're intelligent and when they care about what it is they're doing uh, in, you know, outside of their own terms of ego. And his website's called Shedding the Ego, which I think is a really apt name. So 
That's why I support MGTOW. I'm an individualist. I believe that MGTOW is promoting individualism. And why we don't want to go back to traditionalism? Outside of society trying to dictate to you what your morality should be and um, trying to put constraints on your individual liberties and freedom, um, the, the micro society within that is the way people approach relationships, traditional relationships, in terms of uh, they get together as a half person and they create a bond, a legally binding bond with a person who supposedly is their other half. And the results of that are quite toxic. I guess the best summary is that if you're in a relationship with someone and you're waking up in the same bed, don't you want to know that that person chose to be there? Not just at some point in their life, but that they're choosing to be there every day. The reality is, when you associate with people, if you have a relationship with someone, you want to know that if you wake up and they're next to you, they're only there because they chose to be, that they actively choose to do that. As an individualist, with complete autonomy, there's no binding structure keeping them there. To me, that's what relationships are. You're only there because you chose it. Now for the rape joke of the week. I decided to have a legal name change to help. Help Davison. Now people can scream my name when I'm raping them. <laughs>